This week in lab we're going to spend some time practicing drawing Lewis structures, Vesper structures, and thinking about molecular shape and how the electron distribution in a molecule or ion determines molecular shape. So rather than do a full pre-lab video, I'm just going to do a little run through on PowerPoint. Lewis structures are tools that we can use, are pictures we can draw that describe and show the distribution of electrons in covalently bonded molecules and ions. Chemistry is really all about electrons and where the electrons are. Lewis structures allow us to formally put those electrons in an ion or an atom or a molecule in ways that tell us something about how the molecule is held together. Because of that, we can use Lewis structures to give us some indication of the stability or the reactivity in a molecule or an ion. Now one thing that Lewis structures by themselves really don't do is show three-dimensional structure. We need to use Lewis structures to determine three-dimensional structure, but a Lewis structure by itself isn't three-dimensional. The other thing that we've got to look out for is applying Lewis structures in appropriate places. Things like transition metal complexes really don't work very well if we try to use Lewis structures to understand them. So if we grab a periodic table, Lewis structures tend to work fairly well to describe the bonding and the structure of main group elements. They don't work very well in transition metals. Let's put this away. This is our set of rules for drawing Lewis structures. If you're in my class, you've seen these before. If you're in the other class, you've seen something probably very similar to this. So we'll just run through these and then look at an example so that they make a little bit more sense. So first thing we want to do is add up all the valence electrons in all the atoms that compose our molecule or polyatomic ion. Then we'll draw a skeleton structure using all single bonds. Usually the least electronegative atom of the group is the central atom in our Lewis structure. Then we want to go around and fill all the octets, or in the case of hydrogen, a duet, of all the peripheral atoms using those valence electrons that we added up at the beginning of the process. Any valence electrons we have left over when all of these are full, we can put on the central atom of the structure. Then we get to the point where we want to check the formal charge on all the atoms in the molecule or ion. Now I put this in as a separate step because at this point we may not have a good Lewis structure, but by checking the formal charges here we'll at least be able to tell whether we're missing any electrons or whether we have any extra electrons floating around in the structure. Once we've looked at those formal charges we can then minimize the formal charge distribution by using multiple bonds and seven we're just going to recheck the formal charges because again that helps us see if we got anything mixed up in the middle of the process. All right, what about an example? Let's look at SO2. So step one, add up all the valence electrons. SO2, let's grab our periodic table again. Sulfur is right under oxygen, so one, two, three, four, five, six valence electrons for sulfur, six valence electrons for oxygen that away. Sulfur has six, each oxygen has six, so we have a total of 18 valence electrons to work with. Step two, draw a skeleton structure using single bonds. Usually the least electronegative atom is in the center. Sulfur, less electronegative than oxygen, put it in the center. Single bonds to each of the oxygens. Step three and four, fill the octets or duets of all peripheral atoms. So I have 18 valence electrons to work with. I used up two four in my bonds, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. I filled up the octets of my peripheral atoms, place extra electrons on the central atom. I have two extra electrons. Those are going to get put on the central atom, the sulfur in this case. Now what about formal charge? Formal charge is a way of looking at electron distribution. Formal charge assumes that we've got perfectly purely covalent bonds. Perfectly purely covalent bonds share electrons perfectly. Each side of the bond exactly shares that pair of electrons. So, in looking at formal charge, we want to assign 
all the lone pairs or single electrons that are on an atom to that atom and we want to assign half of each bonding pair of electrons to each atom. Then we can compare the number of electrons that we've assigned to the number of electrons in the neutral atom to determine the formal charge. The way we're going to use this to help us out is right here. This is where it's really important. The sum of all the formal charges on the entire molecule is equal to the charge of the ion or the molecule. Let's take a look at our SO2 example again. There's SO2. I said we're going to split each of the bonding pair of electrons and assign one to each side. So let's look at oxygen. We've got two, four, six, seven electrons assigned, half of that bonding pair. A neutral oxygen has six valence electrons. So for the formal charge, I've assigned one more electron than neutral. So an extra electron will make the formal charge negative one. The oxygen on the other side is exactly the same. Seven assigned, six neutral, formal charge negative one. What about the sulfur? I've got a lone pair, so that's two, and I've got one electron from each bonding pair. So that's two, three, four electrons assigned. A neutral sulfur has six valence electrons. So the formal charge, I have two less electrons than a neutral. Formal charge is plus two. This is where we're going to find our missing or extra electrons. And here's where we've got to add them up. So I've got a formal charge of minus one, a formal charge of minus one, a formal charge of plus two. If I add those all up, the total formal charge, the sum of the formal charge on this picture is zero. SO2 is a neutral molecule. The charge is zero. Therefore, if I've got a sum of formal charges equal to zero, I probably have all the electrons in my picture. They might not be in the right place, but they're at least in my picture so I can work with them. All right, step five is done. Step six, minimize formal charge distribution with multiple bonds if possible. Let's jump back up here really quick to this picture. My oxygens have full octets, so they're satisfied. But what about my sulfur? My sulfur two, four, six electrons around it. Sulfur is really much more stable with an octet, or in some cases more than an octet. This sulfur needs a few more electrons in order to be satisfied. So let's come down here and we can bring a double bond in here by taking one of those lone pair of electrons and making a bond with it. We can do the same thing on the other side, take a lone pair of electrons make a bond. If I've got two double bonds, my sulfur has at least an octet. What about formal charges? Two, four, five, six. I've assigned six electrons to oxygen. Neutral oxygen has six. Formal charge is zero. This oxygen, exactly the same. Six, six, formal charge is zero. The central sulfur, one, two, three, four, five, six assigned, six neutral the formal charge is zero. So by bringing two double bonds in, I've completely eliminated all formal charge. And again, add them up, zero plus zero plus zero, no formal charge, neutral molecule. We should be in pretty good shape. What about that octet rule though? Sulfur has two, four, six, eight, ten. Sulfur has more than an octet of electrons around it. Well, we usually try to avoid that but as long as we're below the second row of the periodic table, we can violate the octet rule if it makes for a more stable structure. So anything that's in the n equals three row of the periodic table or lower can violate the octet rule if necessary. If there's no reason to violate it, don't violate it. But if we can do something like down here, eliminate all formal charge, by violating the octet rule, I tend to lean a little bit more in that direction. The, tr the thing you have to keep in mind there is you cannot violate the octet rule in the second row of the periodic table. So things like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen are never going to have more than eight electrons around them. They're never going to have an expanded octet. That looks like a good Lewis structure. We've got all the electrons represented, We've got formal charges minimized. Looks good. 
how do we take that Lewis structure and go from this electron distribution map, which again does not necessarily tell us what the three-dimensional structure of this is, to a three-dimensional structure. The way I have this drawn, this looks like it should be linear. This particular molecule isn't linear, however. For that, we need to use valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, or VESPER. The reason VESPER works is because electrons are the same charge. Like charged particles repel each other. So regions of electron density around a central atom will repel each other in ways that will minimize the repulsion that we see in the atom. When we're talking about this regions of electron density, a region of electron density is any bond, lone pair, or in some cases a single unpaired electron on the central atom. The number of regions of electron density, which I'm going to abbreviate RED, determines the electronic shape of a molecule or ion. So let's run through those shapes. If I have two regions of electron density, the best way that those can separate themselves from each other is by moving 180 degrees apart. So the electronic geometry in this case is linear. Bond angles, 180 degrees. What about molecular shape? Electronic geometry describes the geometry of the electron pairs. Whether they're lone pairs or bonding pairs really doesn't matter. Molecular shapes, molecular geometry, are defined by where the atoms are. If I've got an atom on each end, this is going to be a linear molecule, and I'm specifying that this is a three-atom linear molecule. If one of these is a lone pair, well then that's not going to count when we look at the molecular shape. In this particular case, it's still a linear molecule, but now it's a two-atom linear molecule. Let's take a look at three regions of electron density. That one's maybe a little easier to think about. So if I have three regions of electron density, the farthest apart they can get from each other is by arranging themselves in an equilateral triangle, so 120 degrees apart from each other. This electronic geometry is called trigonal planar because it's a planar structure, trigonal equilateral triangle. Bond angle is 120 degrees. Molecular shapes, in this case, if I have atoms on all three of these, the molecular shape is the exact same as the electronic geometry, trigonal planar. What if one of these is a lone pair? If this top one is a lone pair, then atom, 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 I'll have three atoms defining my molecular geometry, and that will be bent. You'll see in all of these that eventually you'll get down to a point where there are only two atoms, so all of these will ultimately have a linear two-atom molecular geometry possible. Four regions of electron density. Define a tetrahedron. Now this is a three-dimensional structure, so we need to pull in some extra tools. When we're drawing these, simple lines are in the plane of the paper. Wedge bonds are bonds that are coming out of the paper towards you. Dashed bonds are bonds that are going into the paper away from you. Think about that three-dimensional shape. These are all 109.5 degrees apart from each other in the electronic geometry. Again, if all of the regions of electron density are bonds that lead to atoms, the molecular geometry is also tetrahedral. If I take one of these away, then I've got a trigonal pyramid. Take two of them away, it's bent. Three of them away, it's a two-atom linear. Five re regions of electron density give us a trigonal bipyramid. So this is a trigonal, this is an equilateral triangle with an atom above and an atom below. So this is kind of the odd one in the group because it's got two different bond angles. There are 90 degree bond angles between the, th the trigonal equator and the axial atoms, and there are 120 degree bond angles within the equatorial trigonal part. So again, all atoms, trig by pyramid. If I take one lone pair off, 
It's a seesaw, two lone pairs, T-shaped, linear three atom, linear two atom. And finally, our six regions of electron density is an octahedron. All the bond angles in an octahedron are 90 degrees or 180 degrees if we're looking straight across. And here are the family of molecular shapes possible for six regions of electron density. In all of these three-dimensional shapes, starting with tetrahedral, trigonal bipyramid, octahedral, once you get accustomed to seeing these on paper, they're a lot easier to see. But until you really, your brain starts interpreting these wedges and dashes the way chemists intend them to be interpreted, they can be a little tough to, to work with. So that's one of the main reasons we're doing some modeling. That's one of the main reasons we want you to be able to grab a three-dimensional representation of these and really work with it. So practice will definitely help you out on this. See you.